But uh, Dr. Eric Rizur is currently the Volkonsky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Harvard University. In addition, he's the Area Dean of Applied Physics. Uh, he received his PhD from Leiden University in Netherlands, and he joined, and he initially came to Harvard for a postdoc, and then uh, subsequently uh, became a faculty member of Race Through the Ranks. And uh, he's an accomplished scholar in optical physics. He's published more than uh, 200 articles. He's a recipient of numerous pre prestigious awards and honors, including honorary degrees and professorships. Uh, he's a committed and effective teacher, and that's really why we've got him here today. Uh, he's rightly famous for developing a method of teaching large, sec large lecture classes interactively, which we witnessed this morning, as you see. And, uh, and not only are you teaching them interactively, but effectively. Uh, his methods have been uh, adopted by, by uh, faculty in many disciplines and in many countries. And uh, those who want to learn more uh, can uh, get his book, Peer Instruction, a User's Manual. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mazur. Sorry, and here's a few notes. <laughs> About two years ago, I was boarding a flight for Buenos Aires in Newark Airport. And I sat down in my seat, and next to me sat a young woman who had just obtained her degree from the University of Chicago. We started chatting, and she told me she was working for a cloud-based education company. Now, I had just started my own cloud-based education company, learning Catalytics, some of you may know about it. So I thought I'd better find out what, what she's working on. <laughs> Turns out, her company was making flashcards, you know, these cards that have questions on one side and the answers on the other, for smartphones. Now, those of you who know about my career know that I don't place much value on memorization, so I had trouble not rolling my eyes. <laughs> Now, it turns out that I had just attended a talk by a psychologist by the name of Ruddy Rudiger, who studies memory at uh, Washington University of St. Louis. He had given a talk on campus. And during that talk on campus, he told us about the results that he had published in a, an article that had gotten a lot of media attention, including uh, Science magazine, where he shows that if you study with flashcards, you remember the information well for one or two days, but if you study how much students remember one week after their study session, they only remember 35%. If you wait another week, you can barely measure it. I thought she should know about that. <laughs> so I grabbed my iPad and pulled up the article, and I gave her my iPad. She looked at the iPad for no more than 10 seconds, and then handed me my iPad back. And she looked me right in the eyes, and she said, but we only guarantee that they will pass the test. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. And it brought back all kinds of memory. My daughter was an undergraduate at Harvard. It was very convenient for the weekend she could drive home with me, and on Monday morning we'd drive back to campus to get a good fire maker. I, I sit in the driver's seat. She sits in the passenger seat to my right. Flashcards! Natalie, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I need to know all these amino acids. I tell her, I have an app for that. <laughs> Seriously, I have a great app for amino acids, and some of my work is in biophotonics, so occasionally I need to know the amino acids, but I refuse to remember them, so I just look them up. She says, yes, Dad, but we're not allowed to use the phone during the exam. And that made it clear to me that it's the exam that determines the student study habit. I mean, my daughter and I will often talk about how to learn, how to study, but she had no choice there. And if memorization 
is indeed all that matters, then we should have paid closer attention to what this man said back in the 70s, you may remember him, Father Guido Sarducci, who in the 70s came up with an absolutely brilliant proposal. Proposal is for a five-minute university. How many of you have seen that clip? Many of you have not. Do me a favor. Watch it. Google it. No, not now, please. <laughs> after, my, uh, after my talk. It's very funny. The idea is this. Just teach in five minutes what the average college graduate remembers five years after leaving college. Now, there's a sad truth to that. He gives a lot of examples. For example, take Spanish, right? The only thing you need to learn is, call yourself Sten, how are you? And the answer is, muy bien, very good. Because according to him, and I think I agree with that, even if you take one or two years of college Spanish, five years after you leave college, that's about the only thing you'll remember. And he gives other absolutely hilarious uh, examples. Now, for 20 years, I've been bashing the lectures and how molded approach to teaching. In fact, I did it just an hour ago here in front of you. Because most lectures simply focus, as I made the point in the first part, on the transfer of information. Here, I'm going to say, during the second talk, I'm going to argue that the assessment, too, is often focused on the regurgitation of memorized information or memorized procedures. And consequently, instead of developing 21st century skills, our assessment is often simply focused on ranking and classifying. So here's what I'd like to do in this second talk. I'd like to first reflect a little bit on the purpose of assessment. Why are we assessing students? Secondly, I'd like to identify some problems of assessment. And lastly, I want to end on a maybe somewhat positive note, giving you a few concrete examples of how one might want to improve assessment. So let's start by reflecting on the purpose of assessment. And I want you to talk for a few minutes to your neighbor and try to list as many purposes of assessment as you can come up with. So let's start listening. And one, this, two, and so on. Go ahead. <laughs>
so that they take the facts and procedures and put them in their head. So, motivation? Motivation. Or, or are we talking here about, you know, torture? Unfortunately. Yeah. External and external motivation. Yes. Uh, measuring retention of information? Measuring retention of information. Uh, external and internal motivation. Ex internal. Intrinsic and, and extrinsic yeah. motivation. To try to help our teaching? To try to help our teaching. To rank them, to rate and rank them. To get an understanding of if they can utilize the information that they're consuming. So can they put it into practice? To get feedback on whether or not they can use the information. I was just going to say feedback, but... Okay. To see if we're reaching our program goals and objectives. To see if we've reached our, our program objectives. To give them a chance to practice. To give them a chance to practice. Too bad we don't have students in here because it would be, it's always nice to also get the you know, point of view of students. They, they have less positive things to say. <laughs> <laughs> a few more, you, then you, and you. To monitor and adjust our teaching. To monitor and adjust our teaching. To establish a baseline of both knowledge and ability to synthesize them. To establish a baseline, except that the baseline often comes completely at the end, right? I mean, you want, you want, in a sense, you want the baseline at the beginning of the term so that you can. See where you've gotten them, unfortunately. Not many instructors do that. Yes? Give learners a chance to reflect on what we've learned? To provide a chance to reflect on what has been learned. Very good. I mean, I think that what I have on my next slide pretty much sums that all. You know, to rate the students absolutely and in terms of their peers, to rate the professor and the course absolutely and in the eyes of the department, to motivate both students and perhaps even faculty, to provide feedback on the learning to the students, to provide feedback to the instructors on meeting the needs of the students and the department, to provide some form of instructional accountability, and lastly, to improve the teaching and learning. There's one that you all missed, one important reason, just to jog your memory this so that we instructors can travel to conferences. <laughs> <laughs> but notice that the terms that we had on that slide already are in conflict with one another, right? So now that we have, uh, now that we have the reasons out of the way, let's talk about some of the problems. I already made the case that a lot of assessment is aimed at uh, grading knowledge, and I think a lot of it rather in an inauthentic manner, because much of that knowledge is factual rather than really a deeper understanding or meaning or, or a mental model. So I would argue that even assessment that claims to test problem-solving skill, skills do not really do so. And let me explain why. What is a real problem? When you have a problem, in life, you generally know exactly what the desired outcome is, right? I mean, uh, let's say that you're driving to Syracuse Airport to catch a flight to San Francisco where you have an important job interview the next day. And you arrive at the airport and your flight is canceled. You have a problem. You know exactly what the desired outcome is, but it's not quite clear how you're going to get to that. You're a manager for uh, an investment fund. The desired outcome is no, more money. The question is, how do you get there? You're an engineer for a company. You design a product that accomplishes certain things. Again, the outcome is no. The question is, how do you get there? I, I would argue that just about any authentic problem fits that pattern that is up there. A known desired outcome, it's the pathway to that outcome. Most assessment problems, especially in my own field, physics, but I would say it applies probably more generally than just physics, do not fit that pattern. 
In that case, students are asked to apply a known procedure to find an unknown answer. A car is going along a road, blah, 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 and so forth, and hits a tree. What is the velocity of the car just before it hits the tree? A student reads that, thinks, oh, I've got to calculate a velocity. Here are my procedures for calculating velocity. You eliminate the first two because they don't have the right number of unknowns. Then you take the third one, you just plug the numbers in, and you come up with the unknown answer, and that's what you will be evaluated on. You see the difference between those two? Known outcome, unknown past to the outcome, known procedure, unknown answer. They're two very different categories of questions. And if we put this in light of Bloom's taxonomy, Benjamin Bloom was an educational psychologist in the 50s who came up with a taxonomy of thinking skills, ordered here from lower order thinking skills at the bottom, such as remembering and understanding, meaning you can apply your knowledge within the context that you've learned, to applying, taking the information, taking the knowledge you've learned and applying it into a new context to things like analyzing, evaluating, and at the top, creation, creativity, innovation. So I would argue that inauthentic problems are towards the bottom and more authentic ones are at the top. And I would argue that most education around the world doesn't even get to the third step, applying it to a different context. In fact, I was recently at a, a university in Connecticut, south of Boston, you know, a, a very good university, I won't name any names. And um, I gave a talk in the physics department there. And after my talk, one of the instructors, one of the professors came to me and said, I had something really interesting happen in my classroom this year. He had taught physics for engineers. And he wanted to make his course relevant to his students. And in order to make it relevant, he put it into a real world context. And the context he used was baseball. I mean, there's a lot of physics in baseball, right? Trajectories of balls, collisions between balls and bats, runners running. So in class, he would use examples out of baseball. On the homework, he put baseball problems. On the midterm examination, he put baseball problems. At the end of the semester, he was preparing the final exam. And he realized he'd run out of baseball problems. <laughs> <laughs> so he put some football problems on the exam. <laughs> Professor complained to the students, we've never done any football problems. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing about it. You should really be crying. You're laughing probably because you recognize some of your own students, or maybe even some of your own context, when you were tested in a context that was different from the one in which you've learned. But think about it. Unless you're able to transfer your knowledge from one context to another, you have not really learned. Our students are going to have to apply their knowledge in a context that's different because we don't know what the context is going to be that is going to be relevant for their careers. Our students are not going to be like us, as I argued in my, my first talk. Let's actually take a real problem and turn it into a textbook problem and see where, what happens to the thinking skills according to Bloom's taxonomy. And for that, let me tell you a little anecdote. Fermi, Enrico Fermi, was a, a physicist, Nobel laureate, who taught at the University of Chicago. And he wanted to develop thinking skills among his students. And in order to do so, he would start each class with an estimation problem. And the estimation problems are now, those type of estimation problems are now known as Fermi problems. For example, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? Well, you can just guess at how many piano tuners there are, but you can also try to think about it. Well, there are 10 million people, so there's about two and a half million families. Let's say that 10% of pianos, or maybe 5% of pianos, so you can estimate the number of pianos, then ask yourself how many pianos can a piano tuner tune in one year, and from that, you can come up with a reasonable estimate, not a guess, but an estimate of the number of piano teachers. And in, in, in the process of thinking through, you develop a lot of useful skills. Qualitative reasoning skills, order of magnitude skills, estimation skills, assumptions, and so on. 
Now, I'm a physicist too. I don't start my courses that way, but it, I freely ask myself these things. And a few years ago, I was painting my dining room, and on a Saturday morning, I ran out of paint. So I drove to Harvard Square. And Harvard Square has a hotel called the Harvard Square Hotel. It, it sits on, on, uh, on stilts, so to speak. It's one, one level up from street level. And underneath, there's a public parking garage. Well, it's not really a garage. It's just open on all sides. There's 20 spots on one side and 20 spots on the other. There's two streets on either side. Typically what I do is I pull in, and then if there's no spot on one side, I pull out in the road on the opposite side, and I go back in, and I go around, and around, and around, until finally somebody frees up a spot. And more often than not, I'm in the right side, and then see somebody walk to his or her car on the left, and pull out into the street, and pull back in, only to see that somebody else is ahead of me and takes that spot. So that Saturday morning, for reasons I don't exactly remember why, I decided to stay in one on one side, give up on the other side, turn off my engine. And as soon as I turned off my engine, I thought, how long is it going to take before somebody comes here? I thought about it for uh, 10, 20 seconds and came up with a little model and, and estimated three minutes. I looked at my watch. Sure enough, after three minutes, somebody came and threw up the spot. I felt so good that I could make the best of Now imagine that we turn that into an exam problem. On a Saturday afternoon, you pull into a parking lot with unneeded spaces in your shopping area. You circle around, but there are no empty spots. You decide to wait at one end of the lot where you can see and command about 20 spaces. How long do you have to wait before somebody frees up a spot? I guarantee you, if you put this on one of your exams, your students will go to the dean or the provost and try to get you fired. <laughs> What do you need in order to answer this question? Well, you need to make assumptions. Then you need to develop some kind of a model in order to approach this problem. And finally, you need to apply that model. In terms of Bloom's taxonomy, we're all the way at the top, right? All the way to creation and innovation. Which of the skills lifted on, uh, listed on the left is the one that terrifies the students the most. Assumptions. What if I make the wrong assumption? They never thought about it. You can make an assumption, work out a problem, and then revisit the assumption. Right? Also, you know, it's just scary that, you know, to, to, to venture into this unknown terrain, even though, let's face it, the ability to make assumption is a crucially important skill. But students are so terrified. I know that if on an exam, I don't specify exactly all the conditions, the students will raise their hand. Right? Let's say that, that I haven't said whether or not they can ignore friction, even if it's completely obvious from the context. Professor, are we supposed to assume here that there's no friction? They want you to take the responsibility for the assumption, not take them themselves. But it's such an important skill. Anyway, given that they hate the assumption, let's take it out. We just add one sentence. On average, people shop for two hours. Two minutes is obviously too short. Two days is too long. So this is sort of right in the middle of the path. So now we've removed the assumption. We've maybe gone down a little bit. But you still have to develop a model that nobody's ever seen. So on Bruce's taxonomy, we're still quite high. Still, students would be shocked. What does this have to do with the course that they've taken? And they would still probably you know, revolt. So let's put the model in. Assuming people leave at regularly spaced intervals. How long do you have to wait before somebody frees up the space? And now we've given them the model in the text. On Bloom's taxonomy, we've gone all the way down to maybe the applying level. But the high order thinking skills are no longer there. And still, they'd be furious. Professor, we've never done any parking lot problems. <laughs> so let's now turn it into a standard textbook problem. On a Saturday afternoon, you pull into a parking lot with unneeded spaces near a shopping area where people are known to shop on average for two hours. You circle around, but there are no empty spots. You decide to wait at one end of the lot where you can see and command about 20 spaces. How long do you have to wait before somebody frees up a space? You say, wait a minute. Isn't that what we started out with? Yes. But somewhere in the book, there's this equation, which
which is colloquially known as the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and all you have to do is put in the number 20 and divide by uh, two hours, I mean, and the number of spaces, and you can calculate the time. And all of a sudden, we've gone all the way down to the bottom, because all the students need to remember is that equation. You're laughing about it. We should really be crying. Maybe I've exaggerated a little bit, but I think all across the globe, a lot of assessment, unfortunately, follows that procedure. And I think this is particularly important, because if we think again about these two authentic and inauthentic problems, this, this bottom category can be done by computers. It can be done by computers. And I predict that just as assembly line jobs have been replaced by robots, so will any job that involves the regurgitation of memorized information or the application of rote procedures be replaced by computers. So we better focus on authentic problems, problems where it's not the answer that matters, but the way you get to the answer. Unfortunately, authentic problem solving is erratic. You try out one approach, it doesn't work. You try out another approach, it doesn't work. You try a third approach, if you're lucky, it works. The road to any innovation, I saw innovation on this building as I walked in this morning, and I thought, yes, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, the road to any innovation, the road to any creative product is littered with failures. Thomas Edison didn't just invent the light bulb. I think he made something like 300 pro failed prototypes before, before he finally got a working prototype. So what does that tell you? That tells that failing is a central process of being creative, of being innovative, of finding solutions to problems that have not been solved before. Unfortunately, our grading practices are incompatible with that. Students know if I make a mistake, I lose points. And therefore, they become afraid of risk taking. In a sense, our grading practices stifle creativity and innovation. Let me jump a little bit. Take a look at this picture. I don't think it needs any explanation. You saw within a second what this was. And if this picture evokes pleasant memories, <laughs> then I would like to talk to you all. <laughs> what are some of the feelings that this picture evokes? Stress, anxiety. What else? Fear. Fear. We're only hearing negative terms here. Is any of those words compatible with learning? No, I think they're very, they're, they're, they're the opposite. So what else? There's something else that's really peculiar about this picture. What, else, what other feeling does it evoke? Conformity. Conformity. Isolation. 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 Exactly. Look at these students. They're cut off from each other, and they're cut off from any source of information, only pencils on the table there. Now ask yourself. After graduating college or graduate school or whatever, after your last exam in a university, have you ever encountered a situation in your professional life where you've been placed, separated from anybody else and from any source of information? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had to work under those circumstances? I mean, look, when, when I write a paper on microphonics in my office, there's not somebody standing next to me saying, ah, you're not allowed to look up that paper by this professor at Yale. You should have known it by heart. <laughs> I can look up whatever I want, whenever I want, and I can talk to people. It's not about memorizing information. It's about knowing how to use that information. So why then do we assess our students in a way 
that has nothing to do with their future careers. Traditionally, assessment has been a high-stakes affair, which is why you have these words of stress, anxiety, fear, culminating in the final exam. Students study for exams. In fact, I think many faculty encourage them to study for exams. But as we know, that studying promotes cramming, and as a consequence, information is only stored into short-term memory, and therefore, as I argued in the first talk, there is neither retention nor transfer. In a sense, the assessment is the silent killer of learning, because no matter how innovative our approach in to teaching are, our student study habits are dictated by the assessment. That's what that anecdote that I saw when I talked has been so clear. Instead of studying for exams, students should really study for learning. Assessment should be used as an opportunity to improve the learning. You see there are sort of two aspects in, in the student's mind to assessment. One is the grade, which is a measure of your standing relative to others. And the other is the feedback, which is a reflection on what has been learned. But I would argue that most students don't even get the benefit of that. They take an exam, they hand it in. If they're lucky, it comes back after a week. By the time they've forgotten about everything anyway, because they've crammed. And they look at the grade, which is important, because that's going to tell them have they met the benchmark that is needed to accomplish whatever they want to accomplish. And the feedback is largely ignored. The opportunity to improve the learning is largely ignored. Then there's another serious problem, namely that assessment produces a conflict, a conflict which I will call the coach-judge conflict. I became particularly aware of that when I started to teach a project-based course. Because students are working on a project, I'm coaching them continuously for their projects. And then we get to the project fair. And then the first year that I did that, I all of a sudden realized, God, now I have to judge them. I knew how hard they work. I wanted to give them all A's. In fact, I couldn't give them anything less because I knew how much they work. How do we get away with that conflict? In fact, I know of no other human enterprise where you can be both the coach and the judge. I mean, imagine I was not coaching students, but I was coaching a figure skater. Now we go to the Olympics. And in the Olympics, I say, good luck, and then go and sit and judge. It'd be unacceptable. Unacceptable. But somehow in education, we do that. We get to judge our own handiwork. Now, how do we get away with it? We get away with it by hiding behind a thin veil of objectivity. Right? We can only apply, we can only do this by removing any subjectivity. Being fair, being objective, being reproducible. But here's a big problem. Remember Bloom's taxonomy. The only skill that can be judged completely objectively is all the way at the bottom, right? The, 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 the answer to the problem is 4.2 meters per second. Well, if you write down 2.1 meters per second, it's wrong. No feelings involved. It's just wrong. If you write down minus 4.2 meters, it's wrong. Or if you write down 4.2 without the units, wrong. So in a sense, this conflict forces us to go all the way to the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy. And and basically use as our assessment criteria metrics that are actually not really the metrics that we're interested in. There are many other problems, like grade inflation, cheating. Why would a learner be cheating? Have you ever seen a small child cheating while learning to tie the shoelaces or putting his fork in his mouth? No. Small children, we're all born learners. We're, we're, we keep asking why, why, why. Remember the curiosity you had with the hole in the plate question I had? It's the same curiosity that a kindergartner has. It's innate in every human being. In the beginning, you can't stop that curiosity. Somehow, 
in the transition from elementary school to middle school, are educational practices very effectively during this curiosity off? And it becomes about the points earned on the exam, not about the learning anymore. The good thing is I show to you how easy it's to turn it back on in the classroom in the first part of my presentation this morning. However, the assessment is what ultimately is going to dictate how our students uh, study. So let's now look in the last uh, 10 or maybe 20 minutes at most at four ways that might improve uh, our assessment practices. The first one is, let's mimic real life. Since we're not going to be cut off from information, since we carry our information always on our head, why have students memorize things? Think about my daughter and the amino acids. You know, if she is going to become a biochemistry researcher, she needs to know the amino acids. But we don't know yet, so why make her memorize them if she's going to forget them later anyway? If she becomes a biochemistry researcher, she might have to look up the amino acids 10 times in a week, but then they stick. They stick not because somebody told them, learn this, it's good for you. No, they stick because she needs them and she uses them in the context that is relevant to her. Memorization, and this is how we learn as young learners, right? That should be not enforced from the outside, it should come from the inside because of what you need. So I would strongly urge it for open book exam. In fact, you know, I sort of sensed this early in my career. And the first year that I gave an exam, I provided the students with a formula sheet. The next year, the students saw the formula sheet and they said, couldn't we bring in our own formula sheet? I said, sure, one side. Eight and a half by eleven. Only to discover the students develop a microscopic handwriting, <laughs> and they write the entire book on, on, on one sheet. So the next year I said, you know what? Just bring the book. This way they don't have to copy the book on the sheet. <laughs> and then the following year, our students said, well, you know, in high school I used this other book, which I like more than the book that you assigned. Could I bring that other book? Sure, why not? You can bring any book. So from then on, they could bring any book they want. And if they want to bring in 10 books to the exam, that's fine. A year later, some students said, could we please bring the solutions to the problem set and the notes from class? Why not? You can bring anything you want except another living person. <laughs> <laughs> and then more recently, I started to assess my students on their laptop which means that students have access to Google. They should have thought, wow, is that a problem? Or should I tell them you're not allowed to Google anything? But then I thought, you know, later in life, they can Google whatever they want. I Google things all the time when I need to work. In a sense, one might argue that any question to which the answer can be Googled is not an authentic assessment question. In fact, this is what happens. Look again at Bloom's taxonomy. If you give students access to Google, in a sense, you're chopping away that bottom thing. It's no longer being assessed. You're forced higher up Bloom's taxonomy by giving students access to Google. I'm going to jump again a little bit. I'm going to show you a little video clip. I hope the, the, the volume is not going to be too loud. This is a class in... Um, in Bandung, Indonesia, Bandung Institute of Technology, the students are speaking my legs, so you can't hear what they're saying. I want you to determine, A, what the discipline is that, that the students of this course, and secondly, what are the students doing? So I hope it's not going to be too loud, but we have somebody here to help.
fun. <laughs> now you're happy. But what are they doing? They are taking a test. No. Isn't that a cognitive dissonance? This is a, a, a technique from team-based learning. If you want more information on it, go to teambasedlearning.org. And this part is called the readiness assurance. And what they use is this type of if at uh, scratch card, immediate feedback assessment technique. So for the first half of the examination period, the students answer a number of multiple choice questions individually. And they write their answers on a little piece of paper. One C, two A, and so forth. After 20, 25 minutes, whatever, the instructor picks up those little strips of paper. That's half the credit for the exam. And then places on each table one of these if at scratch card. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are the questions on the test. A, B, C, D, which are the different multiple choice answers. The card has been pre-coded so that the right answer has a star beneath this spain, which is the same paint you have on the lottery card. You can just order those cards. And they'll give you the key for that particular card so you know how to arrange your choices. So the first thing that the students do in this team round, which is the other 50%, and remember, there's only one card per table, right? So that becomes a team grade. It's to a point, a scratcher. Brad, you're going to be the scratcher. Yeah. <laughs> so then we go around the table. One was an easy question. I had C. What did you have? C, C, C. Should we scratch C? Let's go for it. Brad scratches the C. Yes, there's a star. But then, because the test has to be designed so that it is hard enough that even the best students only you know, maybe score 70%, they'll inevitably get to questions where they don't agree. So question two, half the students have B, the other half has A. The A's don't want the B to be scratched off, the B's don't want the A to be scratched off. And now all of a sudden it's not about the answer, it's about how you get to the answer. I answered B because you remember when in, in class when the instructor did this, we did blah, 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 blah. And the others go, oh, yeah. So should we go for B? Scratch B, no star. But the good thing is, if you get it wrong the first time, you can scratch a second time for half credit. Notice that on that row, the score is two, not four. And you know, when they uncover a star, they'll go high five. And in fact, during the exam, they'll go, oh, yes. You actually hear aha moments during the exam. The exam turns into learning opportunity. By the end of the exam, they know what their team scores are, because they can just count. They can s score their own choices, because they set up the exam in front of them, where they kept track of their notes. So they just walk out relaxed, happy, having had fun. I never implemented this in my class. I first saw it probably five years ago. And because I don't like multiple choice questions, but then, we implemented learning catalytics, and learning catalytics give the opportunity to test with non-multiple choice questions, graphical ones, word-based ones, numerical ones, uh, formula-based ones. So this is a picture from my own class where the students are actually taking an exam. Uh, and instead of a, a scratch card in the individual round, they enter the answers to questions. For example, here, what's the derivative of 3x squared minus 6x? This would not be for my class. I'm just putting down a random example here. And then you type in, either on your laptop or on your, uh, your smartphone, the answer. And you do that for all of the questions on the exam. And then at some point, I, the instructor, press on a button that the team round starts. And in the team round, you see the same questions again, but now you can see what everybody in your team has answered. Brian answered 6x minus 6. Brett, 6x. Beth, 6x minus 6. And now, as a team, they have to decide what the right answer is. And they'll go to the board and work it out. And then answer, if it's wrong, the computer immediately tells you, this is wrong. You can try again for half credit. And if it's wrong again, you can try again for quarter credit. And if it's wrong again, it reveals the solution. So let me show you a little video clip of how this works in my classroom. During the individual round, it's not that different from any standard exam. The students sit there, except that they are sitting at their computer. 
and they can Google anything they want, which is fine. That means that I have to make sure that the answer to the question is not Googleable, right? But then during the team round, everything changes. I make a habit of bringing guests in my class during this period and asking them the same question I asked you. And it's always a cognitive dissonance. How can it be? They're looking things up and they're having fun. So my first recommendation was, let's mimic real life. Let's not cut them off from information. Let's not cut off them from each other. You know, you solved the whole cheating problem too this way. Done. All right. Okay, second thing, let's focus on feedback, not on ranking. I would argue our ranking is a complete myth. I can make a long list of people who have been extremely successful and who have flunked out of college. I can make a long list of people who had stellar transcript in college and have not been successful in their careers. I'm on the graduate admissions committee. We get lots of applications. Many, it was absolutely stellar transcript, and when the person comes, you discover, oh my God, this person isn't even able to do this. And I, I, I think you all deep down know that our, and in part it's because we're, we're forced to go all the way to the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy in order to get an objective ranking. In fact, look at some of the results out of my own class. I'm going to show you on the vertical, the final grade on my introductory physics class for pre-med majors, right? And some students had very high grades, others had very low grades. And on the horizontal, this was before I changed my approach to teaching, the score on that FCI that I mentioned in the first talk, the fourth concept inventory. So this, for those who were not there, is a measure of how well students understand the concept of force, which is discussed in week one. As you can see, it's broad in that dimension, too. And there's maybe some correlation, but not that much. According to the person who authored the test, anybody who scores below 23 is still an Aristotelian thinker, has not understood Newton's laws, on which everything else in the course is based. In fact, if you take a gorilla and have the gorilla press random keys, you get you get a score around 10 or so. <laughs> Notice that some students at Harvard need to be in the private section of the zoo. Even though, <laughs> even though, notice that they still scored an acceptable grade. If you take professors and graduate students and you have them take the concept, force concept inventory, you know, most of them will get most of the questions right, but maybe make one. I, I made one mistake when I took it, or two. So, graduate students and professors score in these last three bins. Notice that there's still a broad distribution of grades, all the way to 65 or so. In particular, look at these two students. The student on the left did not understand the concept of force, but got an A for the course. The student on the right got a C, oh, pardon me, got a C and scored at the level of a grad student or a professor. Is this objectivity or is it an injustice? Why are we ranking? We can't really rank. Let's give up on it and focus on feedback. In fact, an experiment was done in the UK where in a high school they eliminated the grades for 10 years and they, uh, there still was assessment, but the assessment was focused on feedback and the students improved their learning dramatically because they focused on the learning, not on the points. No cheating, because why would you cheat, right? You get to test your own knowledge in an honest, authentic way. Let's focus on skill, not on content. The traditional approach to uh, curriculum design, and this is something I got out of this book, Understanding by Design, by Grant Wiggins and J. McFranke, is as follows. In most syllabi, 
we start with a list of topics. In this course, we will cover topic A, topic B, topic C, topic D, and so on. Then you start covering those topics in class, and uh, then you wait a little bit, and then finally you get to some assessment. With this model, the course is completely determined by the content. What Grant Wiggins and his colleague advocate is to use backward design, the same thing you would use in engineering or, or business or, or to solve any problem. Let's start at the output end rather than the input end. Let's ask ourselves, what are the design outcomes? And in the course syllabus, instead of writing, we're going to cover topic A, B, C, D, you write, after taking this course, you will be able to, and you put action verbs there. Most of my colleagues usually like that idea, but have great difficulty doing that. And I don't want to minimize how difficult it is. And they'll write, after taking this course, you will be able to understand topic A, topic B, topic C, topic D. <laughs> <laughs> but then you're back to where you start. <laughs> you can actually work. after taking so you will be able to solve partial differential equation with this or that kind, or you will be able to interpret medieval works of art from this or that region, and so forth. And in order to see if you formulate a good desired outcomes, you ask yourself, what am I going to accept as evidence? And if you can't think of any evidence, then probably your outcome has not been well defined. And only then do you ask yourself, what am I going to do in class in order to maximize this output? If you use this backward design, the course is defined by the outcomes rather than by the input. But even better, you have started to think about the assessment right at the beginning of your course, rather than waiting and, and, and being forced to come up with a metric that might not mean that much. Lastly, let's resolve this coach-judge conflict. What I did in my project-based course was actually very simple. I appointed external evaluators. So I asked some of my colleagues to come and evaluate the project so that I can remain the good guy. I don't have to make this Jekyll and Hyde transition from coach to judge. But then another thing that I think is not exploited expo enough is to use peer and self-assessment which is actually very important because it helps with the development of metacognitive skills. Metacognitive skills is a jargon, psychology jargon, for developing an assessment of your own learning. Nothing is worse than having people who are ignorant and unaware of it, and I, I even an operate, I know quite a few <laughs> come out ignorant and, and unaware. And one, one technique is to use calibrated peer review, a very unfortunate acronym. CPR. Uh, this was developed at UCLA. And uh, basically, it consists of giving the students an assignment and a rubric. It's completely rubric based. And you give the rubric to the students. I've had professors tell me, what? You give the rubric to the students? But then they know exactly what they need to do. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Let's be transparent, please. <laughs> So you give them an assignment and a rubric on how the, how the assignment is going to be evaluated. On the CPR website, the first thing they do is they upload their assignment. So the rubric, here's an example from a writing rubric in one of the courses where I have them uh, develop scientific writing. But it could be any type of rubric and any type of assignment. So the first step is they, they write it, they get the rubric. The second step is they upload it to the CPR website and then starts a review process. Now before this all starts, as the instructor, I have uploaded three pieces, a high scoring piece, a medium scoring piece, and a low scoring piece. And I've uploaded it together with my evaluation on the rubric and the rationale for why I chose the different uh, levels in, in the rubric for these pieces. So after the students have uploaded their pieces, starts a calibration phase. They see the three calibration pieces in random order. Could be high, medium, low, or high, low, medium, or low, medium, high. Any random order, the system shuffles them up. And they have to grade those calibration pieces according to the rubric. If they score close to what I have, they get a high calibration score. If it's low, they get a low calibration score. If it's very far away, they have to do it again. 
And if they fail a second time, then they're shown my calibration was the rationale of why I chose the different categories. This is the prime them in the evaluation. Then they get to grade three random pieces of their peers without names, which provide scores for their peers. Then, and of course, the scores for the peers are weighted with their calibration score. So if they're close to my scoring, it carries more weight than if they're very far away. Then after that, they get to see their own piece again. How often as a student do you have an opportunity to place your own work in the context of that of your peers? Here you're guaranteed to have seen a really good piece, the high calibration piece, a really lousy piece, and some other pieces. And you may have gone while looking at these pieces thinking, God, I wish I had written that. Or you may think, I'm better than all of them. But at least you have some way of comparing what you have done to that what the others have done. And you have to evaluate yourself and give yourself a score. Now, what happens is the grade you get is determined not by the score you give to others. Well, that comes in too. But what the other students have said of your piece, so the scoring by peers will determine your grade, weighted with their calibration score. But then there's also a quality of your self-evaluation. If you thought you wrote a really, really good piece, but your fellow student thought it wasn't very good, you get points deducted for not evaluating yourself correctly. So that's a good uh, incentive to judge yourself honestly. Likewise, the uh, quality of your peer assessment, which can be compared to the other students' ranking of your peers, and the calibration score also factor. This is all done automatically. You know what the best thing is? There's no grading by the instructor. It's all done. The hard work is front loaded. You have to put these pieces in and develop a rubric and so on. But once that's done, it's done, right? No more work. You crowdsource the grade. You can do it in a class of 300 if you want. OK, time is up here. We need to go to lunch. I want to end with a call to action here. And my call to action is really simple. We must rethink assessment. Because if we don't do that, we will continue to educate the followers of yesterday instead of educating the leaders of tomorrow. And just as importantly, if we don't do so, our assessment will continue to fail to indicate how our students will actually be in their future uh, careers. Thank you very much.